goedenavond en welkom bij College Tour. Vanavond opnieuw weer vanuit New York. Zijn ster reist per seconde. Gisteravond zag ik hem in concert hier vlakbij. En de zaal was totaal uitverkocht. Een dampend publiek. Een geweldige optreden. Uh, Europa ligt al aan zijn voeten met miljoenen cd's die hij al verkocht heeft. En de concertzalen zijn vol. En nu moet Amerika eraan geloven. Vanavond interview ik samen met 200 studenten hier in Brooklyn, New York, Stromae. Welkom. Dank je. Welkom. Hallo allemaal. Uh, ja, wat gaan we doen? Nederlands, Frans, Engels? Engels, ja. Engels, Engels? The best is French, of course. Ja. Yeah. Uh, English after and uh, Dutch at the end. I'm sorry. Oké. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I saw you yesterday in, uh, in concert. Um, Thank you for coming. Huh? Yes, and it was the best concert I've ever seen in New York City. And I was not the only one who thought that. Um, Thank you. How was it for you playing in this great city? Uh, je peux parler en français? Oui. Yeah. Ok. <laughs> um, en fait, j ai, j ai, au, au début, j'étais un petit peu euh, déstabilisé parce que, enfin, je sentais que, enfin, j'étais mal à l'aise. J'étais pas, j'étais pas très à l'aise. Et puis finalement, euh, j'ai commencé petit à petit à, à prendre mes aises. Je vais vers la troisième, quatrième chanson. Et donc euh, voilà. Mais plutôt euh, impressionné. Et uh, and you never know uh, how much comes from. France or from Belgium, because when you say, okay, everybody understands French, everybody wants to say yes, but when you begin to speak, you know, a little bit quickly in French, you understand that, okay, no, it's not like, you know, people love to say I speak French, but actually maybe not as they want to, right. uh, you understand me, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a look at a clip that we made. We talked to some people who were just coming in, okay. uh, and uh, just a couple of seconds of the concert, this is it. Okay, this was yesterday evening. Your manager told me this is only the beginning. Next stop in New York will be Madison Square Garden. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> He loves to talk before we do, yeah. <laughs> we do stuff. No, but, uh, yeah, and, and it's actually I'm ambitious like him, uh, and I and I my dream, of course, is to to perform in biggest venue, and yeah, but uh, I don't want to. In French, we say ne pas vendre la peau de l'ours avant de l'avoir tué. So yeah, uh, of course that that, but we we never know, and we don't want to do the Madison Square Garden just you know only for the for your ego, you know. Of course, if you can. You know, it has to be sold out, you know, just yeah. make a Madison Square Garden completely empty, it's not really no, no, interesting. But, <laughs> but seriously, it is the ambition to, yeah. to go there. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, we have a full house here of people who want to talk to you, mm -hmm. and strange things are happening. Uh, because shortly before you arrived in this building, mm -hmm. somebody came here to us and asked us to relay a message to you from a very big pop star in New York City. Okay. And uh, this person is a friend of hers, and he asked me to ask you if you want to come to her place, apartment, after your show tonight. And her name is Madonna. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so.
simply, modestly. <laughs> oh, pretty uh, fine. Thank you. Nice. Uh, hello. Uh. <laughs> now the question is. Uh, Will you like the, to accept this invitation? Uh, actually, I don't have the time. Okay. Uh, it's a <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> of course, yes. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's not a joke. No, it's not a joke. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's settled then. I have one more um, uh, thing I have to, uh, to, to, to give you, actually, which is a pleasure for me. Um, you're very popular in Europe. As I said already, this country is ready for you. And in the Netherlands, you've sold so many records that and thank we you can support. offer you this one. This is double platinum award uh, because you've sold so many. Thank you. Okay. I'm proud of it, but I just don't want to see my face uh, just <laughs> with it somewhere. Interview. But thank you very much. Hartelijk bedankt. And uh, tot ziens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Questions. Please, if you have a question, stand up. The microphone will come to you. And um... uh, Hi. Uh, I guess um, it's, it may be hard for American people to understand French. So I was wondering if you ever considered writing a song in English just to make a better connection to English-speaking countries and perhaps to have a big hit here. Mm. Uh, hello. Uh, and, uh, actually, uh, I don't think it's the best way to, uh, to be understood um, to speak in, in English for me. Uh, I'm sure that um, English-speaking people um, want to have just sincerity whatever the language actually. And I'm the most sincere in my own language. And I'm sure, even if they don't, even if you don't understand my language, I'm sure that you understand the emotions, the feelings, and the groove and everything. And I'm sure if I would just trying to sing in English, uh, it would sound just fake or something. So I, I prefer to sing in, in French. You know, maybe one day, yeah, I will try it, but I'm so shy that I think I will take like five years or 10 years to have the right accent to sing, in, or maybe not, just yeah, to have the right accent and to be sincere. Mm. The both things are, uh, has to, to, be, to be there to, to, to make a, a good song that I judge good. We have a um, little clip of somebody uh, who knows you very well, a DJ from uh, Belgium, about your career. Let's mm -hmm. have a look. You come in your life a few times sterren tegen die echt charisma hebben en hij heeft dat dit is Stromae tous les problèmes alors on danse ja je hebt zo van die nummers die je voor de eerste keer hoort en meteen denkt van hier moet ik op dansen Dat was meteen een hit, instant. En dat was zo van, dan wist je, oké, okay, die gast heeft echt een wereldhit te pakken. Dit is groter dan Vlaanderen, Wallonië, dan België. Formidable! Bij Alorgon Dans wist ik van, oké, okay, leuke hit, nieuwe naam, plezant. Uh, maar toen ik Formidable voor de eerste keer zag... Toen ben ik echt blijven zitten kijken met mijn mond open van hoe geniaal kun je een nummer promoten, zorgen dat je stronzat in Brussel rondloopt, iedereen laten geloven van Stromae zit aan lager wal en dan zo'n nummer maken. En er waren dan vergelijkingen met bijvoorbeeld Jacques Brel uh, en, en dat klopte ook helemaal. Als iemand de manier van muziek maken van Jacques Brel opnieuw heeft uitgevonden, dan wel Stromae. Dan had je ook Papa Oute, waar dan ook over zijn, zijn vader gaat, die hij amper gezien heeft tijdens zijn leven. Het geniale aan Stromae, hij kan alles heel eenvoudig uitleggen, terwijl wat hij maakt ontzettend complex is. Daar zitten zoveel lagen in. Op zijn tweede plaat, een, een nummer, ik weet niet of hij het ooit als single gaat uitbrengen, Moelfriet. Dat gaat, ja... Je gaat eigenlijk nergens over, het gaat over mosselen en frieten. Ja, een soort uh, nationale symbolen waren. Maar blijkbaar gaat het dan over uh, seksueel overdraagbare aandoeningen. Goed gevonden van Stromae. Het is ook effectief door mensen als Stromae, door het wereldkampioenschap, door de Rode Duiven, dat wij ons ook wel Belg voelen. Ja. 
Ik denk dat in het geval van Stromae het een, een, een geniale zet is om te zeggen van ik stop even. Ik denk dat hij bewezen heeft intussen met zijn moeilijke tweede plaat dat hij, uh, dat hij voldoende materiaal heeft om over drie jaar een minstens even goede derde plaat te maken. Is hij right? I completely agree, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> are, you over, are you even overwhelmed or surprised by the level of success? Because it's Belgium, France, it's all of Europe and now maybe this country as well. Of course, yes. Uh, maybe we were more surprised, to be honest, we were more surprised for the first album with Alors on Danse because at this time it wasn't possible for us to sing in French and be listened by non-French communities. Mm -hmm. Actually, just people learn you that, of course, it's not a problem of, of language. It's just we are making music, just making music, and it's about feelings and exact, you know. And you are just thinking that okay, we are exact, ex fine, we are exactly making the the same as they do when you're, they are listening to my music. You know, in Belgium, we used to listen to English music that we don't understand at all, but it's not a problem. We are just what wanna again I wanna and it's okay and it's enough just mm. to sing and it's it's enough we feel just something and it, it's enough yeah questions please stand up here you go um, so you say you're very shy and you're too anxious to perform in English but yet it takes a lot of courage to be on a stage in front of so many people so I was wondering how do you prepare for that as a shy person huh. uh, I think that everybody is shy I just said you know on a certain point like it depends of the it's not a problem for me to talk to you like this uh, but actually in the real life I cannot talk to you like you know just have a conversation it's really difficult for me uh, I don't know why so uh, if you would be alone with her it would be exactly yeah? to have a conversation like a long conversation it's difficult yeah which is pretty weird but uh, I don't understand why but and that's Exactly the difference between my manager and me. Uh, when we have meeting and stuff, he can have a conversation normally, easily. And for me, it's like I'm like, and I cannot say anything. And when I'm on stage here, I can I can like talk and talk and talk, and you know, it's like. Uh, so I didn't answer to your question. What was the question? Um, no, that was my question. Okay. Well, how do you prepare for big events like ah, yeah. on stage? How do you transition? Um, I jump. Uh, I'm trying to uh, warm up my voice. Is it the the right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, kidding, yeah, joking with my uh, older band. Really bad joke, as we can do, <laughs> as you can listen to uh, during the concerts. Um, uh, so yeah, that's the only thing I do to prefer. So if you would step down this stage and you would be Paul van Haver again, uh, mm -hmm. it would be the, um, impossible for you to have a conversation. If Not you impossible. Are well, <laughs> difficult, difficult. Yeah, yeah, difficult. But yes. if you are on stage and you are Stromae, then... I'm trying to do an effort now and yeah. You're doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering because, as I told you, the, this request of uh, Madonna, for example, would you be... Would it be difficult for you to meet her while not on stage and then uh, not uh, yes. knowing what to talk about? Yeah, especially because it's her. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but yes, it's difficult to talk and uh, for me. But yeah, 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 for me it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a student show, and what kind of student was Paul van Haver? That's your real name. What, <laughs> what, what were you good at school? Uh, no. Uh, fin, pff, not no, but the the, the teacher uh, used to say to to my mother, you know, he's 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 not dumb, but the problem is that when a fly is just flying in the the the, the class, he's just like, okay, we lost him. So uh, that was the problem. A Concentration, dreamer. yeah. You were a dreamer. Concentration was the the, the worst problem. Um, so. Uh, Actually, the threat was to send me to uh, to a, a boarding school, and uh, actually, I, I missed my my, my uh, class, so I had to go in the boarding school. So uh, yeah, but it learned me so many things to to go there. Was it um, punishment? Did it feel like punishment at the time when it when was? You... It was yeah? completely yes. Like, uh, but it was so interesting to meet different people than because I came from a modest uh, neighborhood. Not really the hood, but you know, like uh, modest. And uh, I thought that 
rich people was the was bad actually you know was not good and uh, I thought they was just racist but it was so interesting to go in the boarding school like this with rich people to understand that okay you are racist as well as them so it was so yeah interesting for me to understand that it's not only racism is not only against black people or American people or you know racism is just horrib horribly natural you know what I mean it is in everybody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we went to your boarding school and spoke to somebody who knows you very well have a look uh -huh. Il y a 75 ans, le collège tel qu'il existait était géré par, uniquement par des jésuites. Et là, c'était vraiment une élite qui venait au collège parce qu'il avait une réputation à travers toute la Belgique au niveau de la qualité de l'enseignement, au niveau de la discipline, au niveau de l'éducation, des exigences. Donc c'était une vie qui était quand même beaucoup moins ouverte sur l'extérieur qu'actuellement. C'est un collège de garçons, exclusivement de garçons. Paul est un élève parmi tant d'autres. Il était discret, assez effacé. C'était pas un garçon qui était hyper intelligent, qui n'avait pas besoin d'ouvrir les livres. Il fallait qu'il travaille pour pouvoir réussir son année scolaire. Il y a même quatre années qu'il a passé à Godin. La maman était toute seule pour élever ses enfants, puisque le papa est mort tout jeune. Hein. Paul avait sept ans quand son papa est mort, je pense. Et la maman trouvait important que ses, que ses enfants soient dans une école religieuse avec de vraies valeurs, de bonnes valeurs. Elle avait beaucoup d'enfants, je crois qu'ils étaient six ou sept. Hein. Ils sont, il a cinq ou six frères et sœurs. Donc c'était une grande famille pour une maman toute seule. Et là, le fils, je pense, il sentait l'amour la, de sa maman et l'envie de sa maman. Donc ça m'a marqué parce que euh, la maman mettait plein de valeurs à Paul et Paul il est obligé de dire oui maman, ben oui je sais, avec ses grandes jambes qui allaient bien loin en dessous de la table mais en même temps parce qu'il avait beaucoup de respect pour ce que, ce que sa maman faisait comme effort pour pouvoir mettre Paul ici au collège à Godin euh, la grosse ambiguïté avec Paul c'était euh, deux personnages très différents, Paul c'est l'élève que vous connaissez, que vous voyez en études qui n'attire pas l'attention, qui ne se fait pas remarquer et puis quand il y a des fêtes à l'école quand il y a un moment où on fait une fête ici à Noël, où tous les internes sont rassemblés dans la grande salle, et chaque fois, dès le début, dès la troisième rénovée, on appelait les élèves qui voulaient monter sur scène, et Paul, là, il sortait. Donc il s'exprimait, qui se libérait sur scène, qui était vraiment à l'aise devant un public, puisqu'il y avait 300 personnes devant lui, il y avait les 200 internes, et puis il y avait des parents, il y avait d'autres élèves externes qui venaient aussi. Et il était comme s'il était devant chez lui, devant sa famille, euh, directement. Voilà. Bonjour Paul, ben je suis content de te faire une surprise, j'espère en tout cas que ce sera agréable pour toi. Je te demanderai simplement de continuer à garder ta gentillesse, ta simplicité, ta disponibilité. C'est vraiment remarquable et ça je t'en remercie du fond du cœur. Uncomplicated and open, he says, that's how you should stay. Is that difficult in this business when so many people are trying to have a piece of you? Because that's what's happening, I think. Yes, actually, uh, sometimes it's difficult, but uh, it's difficult to complain, actually. That's maybe the the most difficult part because uh, uh, you you cannot complain uh, I guess because you have the success you have the attention that you want you wanted to have so actually you cannot complain but has Stromae the persona Stromae mm. taken over Paul van Aar? it's so important in my life but at the same time that's my job that's only my job like everybody has and uh, Even if the success is extraordinary or without the success, it's just a job. And it's difficult sometimes to keep, to keep that in your mind. And thanks to my family, to my friend, to my manager, to, to my A&R, my executive producer, every, it's important to never forget that it's just a job. And uh, you have to have a rest. You have to take time with your family. You have to, otherwise you just become completely crazy. <laughs> and you're not there yet. You're not crazy yet. I hope so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, wait for the microphone. It's coming up. You said that you still see it as a job, and even though you are successful, I was wondering how does it affect your creativity? Do you still feel that you can make your work as you want to do it, or that your success kind of make you want to adapt to the expe expectations people have of you? Mm. That's exactly, I don't know what's for the future, of course, for the third album, I don't know yet, but for this, uh, fin, between the first and the second one, that was my biggest problem, of course, because you, 
you begin to think that uh, you're making music for, for people, and I'm sorry to say that, but it's a selfish job, uh, and I compose for me first. It's like 70% for me, 20% for my friend and family, entourage, and 10% for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe more, like 20 and... No, but I, I have to be honest with this, because uh, I'm not making music... Uh, you know, if I would make this album, Racine Carré, for the, the audience, for people, I would be just, you know, what is... It's gonna be a problem if there is no success, you know what I mean? If I would have no success with this album, if I, w I would make this album for you, what's my life next to you? Do you know what I mean? What do I just have to suicide, my, you know? Just to... And uh, I, it's so important for me, for my brain, for my... Yeah, I'm, I have to, to just compose for me first. Um, Are you afraid to start? Yes, sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big shock oh, every, every time you change your, your, not your life, but your job, because there is some different part in my job. Interviews is one, uh, uh, the tour is another one, composition is another one. Everything starts from the composition and the, the writing, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's going to be a problem. And after the tour... Because you don't have time for it now to compose? Uh, for me, no. But I can compose if I think that I compose for somebody else. It's mm -hmm. easier. I, it's, I, I think that I have, um, I have too much attention on me to be completely free for the reason I explained to you, so yes. So you have to go in retreat, you have to go... Yes, exactly, in yeah. retreat. Like I need like something like three, four years, I don't know. But I'm asking because I read this news article, an interview in which you said, um, I'm going to quit for three years because this is too heavy, there's too much fame, it's an un unnatural to be so famous, I have to go back to Brussels and be quiet again. Is that serious? I think it's necessary because this success is extraordinary, uh, but extraordinary doesn't mean only good things, bad things as well. And it's so in, important for me just to, I don't have any normal life anymore and I need it, you know. Uh, and of course I have to take time, I have to live a real life just to be just inspired, just to tell something new, interesting. Otherwise I would just talk about what, you know, a bus. <laughs> A tour bus or something, it's not really interesting. I want to talk about real life and I want to live a real life. But uh, no problem, um, everything is okay. You, you will be back <laughs> in three years from now. Yes, just and this to... is the last interview and these are the last concerts. Yeah, and no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Over there, somebody was standing. Please stand up, the microphone can find you. Here you go. Um, I was wondering how did uh, you have, partly you have ru Rwandese roots? Can you tell me how Rwanda has influenced your style, if it has at all, of course? I used to say I'm 40% uh, Rwandan and 60% uh, Belgian or European or whatever. It's because I was born and raised in, in, in Brussels that I couldn't say yes, you know, I'm African. And it's difficult to say, how can, I don't know Rwanda, you know. I don't know Rwanda as the country, as the, the place there. So I, it's just to be respectful for the country that I say this, I'm 40 and 60, but uh, it's never late, too late, so I will go to Africa to, yeah, just to connect again, because I went there only one month. Over there. Your uh, former mentor at your boarding school just uh, told us during the clip that your mother had really high expectations of her children, and probably also of you, and do you feel like you're living up to her expectations, or did she have a totally different career path in mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the expectation he was talking about was more about school, of course. She just wanted me to succeed. She knew that I was pretty... The only moment I was concentrated on something uh, was when I was drumming or, mm -hmm. you know, making music. So she knew that, okay, maybe it will be the only thing I could do. She always um, said to me, uh, don't forget that music is good, okay, but you know, it's how many p 
people could re can really uh, live out the music. You know, it's so it's a big. I'm lucky, so I, I know that. So, uh, what did you tell her when she warned you for not making a salary out of it? I continue not university, but the same. Uh, and I learned a uh, sound engineer at cinema school, and I finished my uh, my class. And I knew that with or without success, I would continue to compose next to my real job. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had I have the I'm lucky, and I can live out my my passion. So so I'm so happy, and thank you because because of you actually. You did a talk at TEDx uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, also I saw these clips on uh, online in which you that you call lessons mm -hmm. lessons of music. Let's have a look at that. Quand quand difficult is it to make, to make a people, an audience, uh, dance and sing? If it make me dance, it could make somebody else dance. Uh, and not only me, actually. It make us dance. Okay. Where's the microphone? Hello, Stromae, Paul. I'm uh, Belge. Bonjour. My friend is also Belge. He was here in New York. And when we had this opportunity to see you here, Nous, en, nous avons pensé, mais oui, bien sûr. Merci. Euh, mais qu'est-ce que nous voulons savoir, euh, en fait, c'est euh, que le, le fait que tu es vraiment un symbole, une symbole belge euh, pour la Belgique et, et que tu vas vraiment contre toutes les tendances dans les journaux, les tendances anti-belges, en fait, nous voulons savoir euh, pourquoi tu fais ça. I think there is no country a perfect country. Uh... And Belgium is not perfect. Maybe that's why I'm, I'm happy to was born there, fin, to be born there, uh, raised in there. Actually, I don't want to be, and I'm not a, a symbol. Uh, if you think so, it's okay. But thank you for the compliment because uh, I think it's a compliment. But uh, why not? Actually, because it's it's part of success. Is also that people. Um, Recognize something in you uh, mm -hmm. that is typically for Belgium. Why do you not want to be that symbol? I, I am Belgian. Mm -hmm. I won't. I won't say I'm not. Be I'm, I'm not Belgian, of course. But I cannot speak in place of anybody. I'm me. It's the beginning of the big pretension. I'm pretentious, of course, because of you know the proof is my job. Uh, but. Uh, think that you can think in place of a country or ten person or whatever, ten million or one one billion. Uh, I cannot do that. So, but of course, I'm proud to to to, to come from from Belgium and uh, and you I don't want to be the symbol or the the flag of the country. No, no. But but it's maybe it's unavoidable in your case. I don't know if you have a say in it. Let's listen. We asked Irupo. Uh -huh. uh, we told him, well, we're going to interview Stromae in, uh, in New York. Okay. Oh, uh, I have a message for him. This is it. Okay. <laughs> C'est une occasion pour exprimer ma fierté et celle de tous les Belges pour ce que tu fais. Notamment, tu as réussi à inspirer des gens de tous les âges et de toutes les classes de la société avec un message de tolérance, de respect multiculturel, tu rends les gens heureux. Après la Belgique, la France, ce sont notamment les États-Unis, les Pays-Bas qui découvrent ton immense talent 
Franchement, nous sommes très fiers pour toi. Comme tu le sais peut-être, j'ai offert ton album à Barack Obama au moment où il a visité la Belgique. Je ne doute pas que s'il a écouté, il est devenu fan automatiquement. J'ai juste un petit souci que je dois te confier. Bah, tu le sais, je porte le nœud papillon depuis des décennies. Maintenant, avec ton arrivée, je suis détrôné. Le roi des Belges du nœud papillon, c'est toi. Voilà, je m'y fais. Ce fut dur euh, au début, mais voilà, maintenant je vis parfaitement en symbiose en numéro 2. Mon cher Paul, pour devenir sérieux, je te souhaite encore plein de succès. <rire> Merci pour ce message. <laughs> But now about this role, what are you saying? That you are building bridges between mm -hmm. generations and uh, cultures. Mm -hmm. Is that the role that you want to have? Um, actually, it's more selfish than this at the beginning. I cannot lie and say, yeah, that was my ambition just to, you know, uh, you know, it was just because when I compose, I just, I hate snobism um, and it's difficult to fight it against that every day. So uh, actually I'm not making music for a hip hop community or black community or white community or rich people or, you know, or young or old people. I'm making music for everybody who wants to listen to it. That's all. So, uh, and it's, What's for a beautiful gift back to have so many different generations uh, who are listening to, to my music. So that's one of the best compliments I can have. Like the youngest, like five years, who is singing Papa Ute, mm -hmm. and an old man who is just like, and all the time they are so shy to say, yeah, I'm sorry because I'm too old to listen to your music. But no, you're not too old to listen to my music. You can listen to my music, of course. And I'm so proud to to know that you, you like my music. Thank yeah. you so much. Here we go. Where's the microphone? In the back. Hi, it's Tomai. Hello. Uh, my name is Laura. I'm from Belgium. Okay. Um, J'habite à Louvain, tout près de Bruxelles. Ah, But I had to come all the way to New York to meet you, so I'm very excited. Ah. <laughs> no, no. Merci. <laughs> And uh, I'm actually also Rwandan, so you see, I like you for many, many reasons. Um, <laughs> My question was, uh, do you see some singers or artists or people as an example or an inspiration for your music? Yes, double langenote. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, Cesaria Evora for me is the, the face of dignity. And uh, maybe it's because I didn't know her very well, so sometimes you You're just putting somebody on the, I don't know if, I don't have the word, but in French we say, uh, sur un piédestal. Yep. Like, and for me, uh, she's the face of dignity. She, I, I saw her once performing here in uh, New York City. Why are you, because her influence is in your songs, you even are singing about her. Uh -huh. What is it that triggered you most, listening the first time, hearing her voice and her music, that you thought, this is what I need as well in my songs? Something that I, I'll, I will never have, <laughs> unfortunately. Force tranquille, we say in French. Tranquille power, I don't know how to, how to yeah. translate. <laughs> uh, quiet power or something like that. Yeah. She's like, no moving, just, yeah, the only move she, she can do is like, right. that's, that's her dance. Yeah. And it's so nice. Uh, I was crying when I saw her on stage one time, only one, once. And uh, I was so impressed and touched by, I was crying. Um, and because how somebody can send you so much power without doing anything, you know? Anything, of course, she was singing, but no move. And for me, it's just impossible because I'm jumping all the time, you know? For me, entertainment is like jumping all the time. And I think that she was so right to just doing nothing and just give you emotions, feelings, just like, yeah. You were standing here, but I don't know where the microphone is. Right? One of your biggest hits is Alors and Dance, which uh, speaks about like this generation, 20-somethings. Um, and there's a lot of criticism about this generation. Like, we're narcissists uh, without ideals, is what a lot of people say. 
Do you agree with that? I did a song about the, um, the subject of nar narcissism, which is uh, Carmen. I just wanted to, because Carmen of Bizet, which is a, a, an opera song, uh, was about love. And actually, I just wanted to, to talk about the love in 2014, which is more love uh, of you, of yourself. And uh, I think I'm the worst example of, of this, so I cannot give you any advice. You know, I'm the extremism of narcissism. So uh, I cannot say anything. Uh, just, <laughs> just maybe, yes, it's important to love yourself. I think it's important, but not too much. Um, so please uh, stop uh, taking pictures of yourself. <laughs> no, no, but I have no advice. Of course, it's, it's bad. I think every extremism is bad for you. That's the reason why I need to go back home for three, four years, just, you know, uh, just live normally. You, you have been uh, talking about uh, Rwanda. Your father was born there, and mm -hmm. uh, we had a Rwandan student, a Belgian Rwandan, uh, in the in the hall. Um, what happens when people don't care anymore is what happened there exactly 20 years ago mm -hmm. with uh, the genocide. And for the people who forgot what happened, this is what happened. 6 april 1994. Er wordt een vliegtuig neergeschoten boven Rwanda met daarin de president van Rwanda. En op dat moment breekt aan de grond een burgeroorlog uit. Uh, en daar zijn binnen drie weken zijn daar naar schatting 800.000 mensen bij afgeslacht. Dus het was een hele bloederige afslachting van één bepaald bevolkingsdeel. De Belgische kolonisator heeft heel erg lang één bepaalde bevolkingsgroep voorgetrokken. Die kregen de belangrijke functies, de belangrijke overheidsfuncties. Dat waren de Hutus. Uh, terwijl de Tutsis eigenlijk in de meerderheid waren, maar die waren kansloos binnen dat Belgische koloniale bestuur. En dat heeft uiteraard ontzettend veel kwaad bloed gezet. Die bom is gebarsten. Radio Milkulim is heel erg invloedrijk geweest in die oorlog. Het was een van de weinige mediums die mensen destijds ter beschikking hadden. En uitgerekend die radio heeft toen uh, uh, afschuwelijke oproepen 24 uur per dag gedaan om de kakkerlakken dood te maken. En die kakkerlakken die waren dan Tutsis. En daarom is het heel, heel bijzonder dat uh, iemand als Stromae precies het tegenovergestelde doet, hè? waar zijn vader het slachtoffer is geworden, heel ja, indirect dan van zo'n radio Milcolin en de haat die gezaaid is door, door zo'n radio, dat hij uh, zo roep, oproept tot eenheid en dat hij probeert tegengestelde groepen juist bij elkaar te brengen door middel van jouw kunst. Is it difficult to watch these um, um, images of Rwanda and the genocide there? Uh, yes, I think it's uh, um, more difficult for somebody who was there at this time. Uh, uh, of course, it's my origins and I lost my father uh, because of this. Um, so, of course, I'm touched. But, um, um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's hor actually it's, it was horrible uh, and a horrible lesson, human lesson, I think. Do you see yourself as a victim as well because your father died there? Of course, actually I didn't know it uh, if it, he was dead or not, but um, uh, I knew it a little bit. You know, no, so, nobody had the courage to courage. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, courage to to tell me that he was dead. Uh, and I knew that because there, I had no more news or from anybody. Nobody wanted to to talk about this. So I, yeah, I knew that it was finished. So I just asked to my to my own mother, and uh, they said, no, it's. Uh, I think he's dead. And I think the most difficult for 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 in this case is that. Nobody found, or not many people found, the, 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 the bodies of their family. And when you don't have the body of your family, you still think that he's still alive. And maybe that's the most difficult part of, of this horrible, but um, of course. And, and your father was never found uh, in, in Rwanda? Uh, no, actually they just found a, a shirt and uh, yeah. 
and we can suppose that that was her, his shirt because the the ID or something was inside. So, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Um, But, and it's the case of so many person in this horrible. almost one million people uh, yeah. working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where's the microphone? You talked a lot about Brussels throughout the show here, and I wanted to ask, apart from Le Moule Frites, what inspires you about Brussels and Belgium? To be honest, I was inspired by um, Serge Gainsbourg, because uh, he did a song which, is, which was uh, uh, Annie aime les sucettes, and uh, that's the uh, inspiration of this song. It was a 16 years old uh, singer who was sing singing this song, which is Lollipop, uh, Annie Loves Lollipops. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do the opposite of this song, actually, uh, which is more about, okay, Polo, you just want to fuck every, world, uh, every woman on the, on the earth, but pay attention to your um, health. And uh, unfortunately, Polo died at the end. <laughs> I have to talk about the, uh, une maladie uh, tr sexuellement transmissible. Donc, uh, c'était, it was so obvious to talk about this. But why do you? So he has a message uh, that you want to relay, apparently. So you want to give a message to the kids that are listening to your music. Uh, do, safe. That's the only way to go. Is that? <laughs> That's the message of the song. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it, should every song, every Stromae song, have something like that in yeah, it? Yeah, I think I'm like this. I'm sorry, but I'm a little bit paternalist. <laughs> I need the morale. I need to, yeah, have a story. I want to tell a story all the time. I want to, and most of the time there is a a death at the end. I'm sorry, uh, or not a death, but something not really happy. But I think that life is like this. Uh, It's not only happiness, it's not only sadness, they both at the same time is melancholy, and that's why I'm And that's you, that's, that's in your character, the melancholy, mm -hmm. the drama. I was uh, talking about uh, Cesaria Evora, mm -hmm. and for me that's this, the face of uh, uh, melancholy. You know, it's not because we are dancing that we have to hide our problems, you know. It's so important to dance on it, to, it's a way to heal yourself uh, because of, you know, the rudeness of, mm -hmm. of life. Uh, so it was, yeah, it's important for me to, to have this, you know, it's possible to dance and cry at the same time. Who decided to say that, no, it's not possible. You cannot cry and dance at the same time. Where's the microphone? Um, I wanted to know if, you know, with music also comes dancing. Did you ever take any classes? Um, did you just, you know, dance when you were a teenager? Actually, I, I took no, no dance class uh, before one year ago. Uh, so I met a choreographer, which is, uh, who is uh, Marion Motin. Uh, she came from, she come from uh, Paris. And actually, I had a big problem with dance and choreography in general. Cause, and she helped me to know The reason why I hate uh, choreography, I actually now I know, uh, it's because uh, there is so many times that uh, people just want to demonstrate that they can dance, and that and she explained me that actually that's the problem why I hate dance, and we worked like one day, uh, and she said to me like okay just feel free to give to me what do you feel when you hear the song Papa Ute and stuff, and I was like okay so I was just. <laughs> Of course, uh, I felt a little bit ridiculous, like, uh, okay. And, uh, and it inspired a lot the choreography of, uh, of, uh, of Papa Ute. That's why I'm... And all the time, I don't know why, and she was criticizing me, because all the time I just... It's in, I, I want to be ridiculous, I want to be weird, I want to be... Uh, to show something bad from, from me. Uh, for the, the song of cancer, I'm all the time like this, and this kind of movement, like I'm like uh, an horrible insect. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, it's it's maybe because I I'm not comfortable with my body, <laughs> which is uh, pretty uh, skinny, uh, and I think so. I think I'm not so proud of my body, and uh, I don't know why I'm talking about that. But uh... <laughs> you can share. <laughs> Here you go. Everyone knows you. How do you stay like down to earth? Make sure that you stay yourself. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not the right person to say you if I'm down to earth or not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that 
uh, stay down to earth was, you know, before I thought uh, that stay down to earth was just to say yes for each piece, picture that people ask you to do, mm -hmm. to make. And now I understand that sometimes you have to say no, actually, because uh, sometimes when the success is too huge and too extraordinary, uh, you have to protect yourself and you have to take, to have a rest, to have some holiday, like everybody has. Do you still enjoy it? Of course. Okay. No, it's not. <laughs> But sometimes I'm so exhausted that you, it's not like you, you don't enjoy, but you know, it's, When you are exhausted, you cannot enjoy anything, you know? And yeah, you have to take a rest and sometimes you, 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 you forget that because I love so much working. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's not good. Every extremism are dangerous, work as well. It sounds like it's almost uh, cannibalism, the fame, that it's eating you. Mm -hmm. Is that what is happening? And yes, exactly. And, and at the same time, it's difficult to complain, you know? Because you asked, you asked for, Uh, so, so uh, how, how can you complain for this? So, um, it's just a balance, a good balance that you have to, to keep. One more question here. How did your fame like, affect your relationship with your family and with your friends? I think that um, it's, yeah, it's difficult for, for, for them maybe more than me. Because I asked for this. They didn't ask for this. And, uh, and they don't have the choice to be the brother of or to be the mother of. And uh, I apologize all the time because, uh, yeah, I'm not really proud to take so, so many plays. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. To take so many plays sometimes. And, uh, yeah, maybe it's not the place to, 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 to apologize about this here. But, yeah, uh, I'm not really proud of this. What is the best advice based on the career you had now and the mm -hmm. life you had now you can give to the students here and people who are watching this as home, at home? Um, je vais répondre en français. Uh, et uh, c'est parce que enfin je vais encore focaliser sur le fait que vous avez parlé de carrière etc alors que enfin je veux dire j'ai fait deux albums et on parle pas de carrière donc c'est pour ça qu'en plus j'ai encore moins de raisons de donner des, des conseils mais de toute façon même si j'avais une plus longue carrière j'aurais j'aurais pas envie de donner de conseils parce que qui je serais pour donner des, des conseils donc voilà inutile phrase que je viens de vous dire euh, ce que je j'ai comme conseil à donner c'est juste euh, et c'est Euh, ouais, juste faire, faire ce que vous avez envie de faire, en fait, c'est tout. Faire ce que vous avez envie de faire, c'est tout. Voilà. C'est trop mal.